Father in heaven, we want to thank you again this afternoon. We worship you, we glorify your holy name for your goodness in our lives. And as we share with your children this afternoon, Lord, we pray that you be with us. Help us to minister to one another and with one another. May whatever it is that we are going to share this afternoon be uh, meaningful to our lives and to your children. But above all, Lord, we pray and ask that your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Caroline. Um, as you heard, this is Hospital Chaplaincy Sabbath. And uh, I'm just thankful for the programs of the morning up to this afternoon. Thank you, Brother Okal, for that uh, session. So I'm going to introduce the panelists from my far left. You can just say your name and uh, just introduce yourself. Thank you very much. I'm uh, Chief Andrew Okal. I'm a member of the panel. Happy Sabbath. Happy day. Uh, my name is Caroline Boyer. I'm a member of this church and I'm a counselor. Thank you very much, Carol. Uh, my far right. Uh, happy Sabbath. Uh, my name is Tom Uma. I'm a member of New Life SDA Church and I serve in the chaplaincy ministry. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you very much, Elda Uma. My name is Lili Kidayu. I'm the hospital chaplaincy leader, and I'm happy to have these uh, great panelists who are going to, we are going to share a moment or two to discuss something about the department. So uh, before we start, let me welcome also the online viewers. You are fully welcomed. Thank you for the physical audience that is here for sparing some time to just come and be with us as we continue to minister the word of God. So for the online viewers, uh, you're free to communicate to us via YouTube. Uh, you can also communicate to us via Neymar, uh, Radio Nema and uh, via the Facebook. We will go through your chats and if anybody else wants to ask a question, we, also, we will also ad address them at the end of the, of the program. So as we start, uh, let me start with the first uh, 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 question, which goes to Elder, Elder Tom. What is, it, what is this uh, story of Gilad, Balm of Gilad? What is, what is it about? The title is, is the, Gil, uh, the Balm of Gilad for me. Tell us more about it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think this is what we are going to talk about this afternoon. And uh, I want to start by saying that uh, maybe we need to understand what this means. Uh, this is a very strong statement that we find in the Bible. And uh, especially we find Jeremiah talking about it. But when we look at the origin of the balm of Gilead, you find that this was a, a perfume, some kind of, uh, of sap liquid that was oozing from some special trees that were found in the eastern side of the River Jordan at the foot of Mount Gilead. And, and this, this sap was believed to be having some medicinal values. And so it was commonly applied for healing. One, it had some characteristics that made it be of medicinal value because it had a soothing effect that if you had a wound, it would give you that soothing effect. It also was able to relieve one of his pains. And then it would also give the healing. So this was a common substance or liquid that was found specifically from this particular 
trees that were growing at the banks of River Jordan. And, uh, and this made, brought the belief that it had the healing effect. And so when we see Jeremiah talking about it, and uh, allow me to refer you to the book of Jeremiah chapter 8. Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 22 the Bible says that uh, this is the prophet now when he was mourning he says that is there no balm in Gilead is there no physician there why then is there no recovery for the health of my daughter of the daughter of my people. In other words, we also know that Christ is also referred to as the chief physician. So when the servant of the Lord was crying in this manner, he was now trying to make, bring the relationship between this balm of Gilead to the impact or the effect of the physicians. And we know that the physicians are those who treat us in the hospitals. And from the biblical context, we understand that Christ is the chief physician. Now, to bring this into perspective, I, I would want to say that uh, in those days again, and even today, most people believe that sickness is caused by sin. So that any time someone was sick or was blind or was lame, the most prominent question that people would ask is that, which sin did this person commit? So, in, in other words, it means that to get out of your situation, you need some healing to take place in your life. And to get this healing, you need the salvation from your sin. So, I think as we continue to discuss about this topic, uh, as far as hospital chaplains, I just want to say that uh, it brings us into that perspective of someone crying outside there, that is there hope for me? Is there salvation for me? Is there any healing available to me? We know that doctors will treat but God would do what? Would heal. So let us think in that line, even as we continue to talk about this particular topic. That is my understanding. Thank this. you very much, Elder Tom. Uh, quite interesting uh, from where it ca it's coming from, even the reference that you've given from the Bible. But I've, I've heard people asking, and it's a question that I believe some of you could be asking. What is, what is this hospital chaplain? What, what does it entail? What is it all about? So we want to hear from these panelists. They, they need to tell us what is it, it, it all about? What, how can we really talk? When you're talking about hospital chaplains, what are we really saying in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a point of view that we, all of us, can understand? Brother Okal, kindly. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I must say, when, when you talk about chaplaincy, you should think of a ministry that is, uh, is outside our normal comfort zone. It's, it's a ministry that goes beyond. We are reaching the unreached, but we are reaching them through compassionate ministry. So when we are talking of hospital chaplaincy, we are talking of compassionate ministry. We are talking of, can you be able to love somebody before you talk about the Sabbath? We are too quick to understand uh, today is the Sabbath. But uh, are we able to... You see, it's one thing for you to tell me that it's the Sabbath, because that is the truth. But you can't tell me it is the Sabbath. I have just injured my leg. I am bleeding. And you're telling me, hey... First of all, let's deal with the Sabbath. Your, your, your bleeding leg will handle afterwards. Now, chaplaincy is a ministry that is meant to be compassionate. We are presenting the Lord as the Lord did it. 
In fact, l l let me give you a few examples. When you turn to the book of Luke chapter 5, Luke chapter 5, uh, 11, the widow of Nain has lost the son. Everyone is crying about. Then the Bible says that uh, in verses 12, Now when he was come near the gate of the city, a dead man carried out the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. Much of the people of the city were with her, and the Lord saw her and did what? Had what? Compassion. Are you seeing that? The Lord had compassion. Let me give you an, another classic example. Uh, in fact, this is a Sabbath story. A, a Sabbath story on, on the Sabbath. Luke chapter 6, verse 6. You know the man who had a withered hand. It is on Sabbath. This man, uh, he meets uh, Jesus. Then Jesus, Jesus doesn't even talk to the man. Doesn't even tell the man that you know, have, have, have you checked the sanctuary message? I've, while I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, personally I like sanctuary, I love prophecy, I, I love eschatology and all these things. But look at what Jesus did. First thing, Jesus just tells the man, stretch forth your hand. So Jesus focuses, Jesus does this, he relieves the physical so that you can be interested in the man who relieves the physical. When we are going out to people, you see, you cannot go preaching to somebody who doesn't have clothes, and yet you are fully clothed. You are even having extra clothes, and you're telling them, just focus on heavenly things. Hey, we are living on earth. Though we are heavenly minded, but we are living on earth. We must be relevant to people on earth. That is why hospital chaplaincy then, the church provides an organized platform. For us to reach out to people who are in pain, people who are in the hospitals. Do you know if there is one place where we are prone to say, God has forgotten me, it is in the hospital. If there is a place where somebody can easily give up on God, it is in the hospital. So hospital chaplaincy gives us a platform for us to go and tell somebody that God still loves you. To go and remind somebody that the fact that you are sick does not mean that God doesn't exist. It only means that God exists and God can be able to do you much more than this. So hospital chaplaincy is a platform that the church has for as many of God's children as possible can participate in reaching out to others the gospel of Jesus Christ, but in what way? Through the channel of let's address their suffering, which is the illness, as we are able to present to them. And, and we explain two things here. Sin leads to sickness. Uh, that is not directly. Not that every sinner is sick, but ultimately where the sickness problem came from was sin. The moment when Adam and Eve sinned, now sickness became our portion. So you see, we are reminding people that there is there is another form of illness. There is a spiritual illness which the Lord is seeking to address. And this God, he can clear both the physical and the spiritual. But how will somebody who is sick know that if we don't go to them? Maybe it's uncharacteristic for the panelists to ask the moderator a question. <laughs> but maybe, <laughs> maybe just asking you, my sister. Um, in a hospital setup, do you think there are people who are in hospital and nobody has ever come to visit them? Yeah, Do you think there are people true. who are in hospital and they don't, their relatives are far away and they are here and the only other relative they came with over here is too tired, cannot even be able to stay in the day, has gone away? Mm -hmm. We should not think, by the way, let me tell you, the reason God has placed us around here may be so that we are the ones to visit this person whose all his relatives are at home. For those relatives to come and pray with him, the relatives need to do a fundraiser for five of them to come. And here we have 15 of us who can go and become the relative of this person. What if the person in that bed is your next door neighbor in heaven? Hospital chaplaincy is relevant <laughs> for <Man>. these times. <laughs> can I just add something to that? Eh? Yeah, it's, it's also very important for us to understand where this ministry is coming from. Maybe probably you are seated there and you think 
this is part of the Adventist church uh, structures and, uh, and uh, it, it was designed by the general conference. And I want to tell you far from it, this ministry was initiated by Christ himself. And I just want to emphasize what Elder Chief has said. This ministry was initiated by Christ himself and this ministry is geared towards offering spiritual guidance and pastoral support. And when we look at the Christ method, Christ has given us the method on how to go about this ministry. But allow me to take you to this text of Matthew 25, verse 34, going to 36. I want to read so that we get this in proper perspective. That then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 35. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you took me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. What is Christ trying to tell us here? That when someone is outside there, is naked, he's talking about the naked being clothed. Isn't Christ talking to us about street ministry? When he's talking about that I was hungry and you gave me food to eat, he's still talking about street ministry. He's talking about hostel ministry because, uh, you know, uh, there's a time I went to visit a relative who was sick. And uh, as you know, the ward arrangement, you find like six people in the same cubicle. And, and we went with some, some items, food items, uh, and flowers and all this. And uh, during the conversation with this, the person we had gone to visit, then she tells us that, you know, this person next to me, I found her here. And I've never seen anyone coming to, to visit her. And uh, I'm always visited. Every visiting hour, there's someone coming to see me. So she was telling us that, uh, you know, most of these things you brought, can we just give them to the other patient? And that got me thinking that uh, there's someone who is in hospital and is hungry and needs some juice to drink, need some water. And when the Lord says about that uh, I was uh, naked and you clothed me, I was sick and you visited, that is about hospital ministry. Then he goes to prison ministry and he says that I was in jail and you came to me. So, as we talk about this ministry today, let us think of what the Lord expect of us. And this is not Adventist Church program. This is Christ's own initiated ministry. So when we do this, we seek to attend to the sick. We seek to attend to the relatives. And, and have you ever asked yourself when someone has a patient who is not able to probably even take in medicine or eat due to their condition. What do you think that relative or that caregiver is going through? We are also attending to healthcare providers. When the doctor is trying to change prescription and everything is not working, samples are taken to the lab for testing and results are not producing anything that the doctor can rely on. You know, at that point, you find that depression crops in. So you find that this ministry is about being a provider. And when we talk of provider, we are meeting the physical need. And that is Christ's method. It's about facilitator. When we talk about a facilitator, it's like we've identified that this guy, this person's need, he needs 
something to read. This kind of material he needs to read, or he needs his pastor to come and speak to him. So, you are facilitating that process as a chaplain. We are talking about a caregiver. You are trying to support this sick person to handle their basic, basic operations. So, you are there to support them. You are being, we are talking about advisor, and this is where counseling also comes in. So, it is a full ministry that is initiated by Christ, and we are just to serve. Our calling is to serve in this ministry. Amen. Thank you very much, Brother Tom. Uh, let me come to Sister Caro here. Um, yeah, Brother Tom has just uh, alluded to the fact that it is a compassionate ministry. And when you're talking about compassionate, you're looking at Christ, how he, he is compassionate. When you look at the book of Matthew chapter, chapter 14, verses 12 to I think 21, which, which showed how Christ is compassionate when he, he fed the 5,000. He came in, in, in his way of, you know, the method, the Christ method alone, in, in a way that just did not, he did not support them physically, but he wanted to support them spiritually so that they can follow him, as uh, Brother Okal was just speaking about earlier on. So, Sister Caro, when we are talking about uh, hospital chaplaincy and how we need to, to approach those who are in need, in need in terms of their physical ill health, we believe there also their mental uh, capacity has been uh, affected. And so how do we approach them? Because hospital chaplaincy has a component of, of counseling. So how do we prepare ourselves even when we go to give these services for those who are able to visit them as well? You can break it down a bit. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Lillian. Um, I want to share briefly even from what uh, Elder Okal said. In counseling, it's called uh, first aid. You first of all deal with their immediate physical need before you now attend to what has brought them to where you are. Someone can't come to you in a counseling room and is bleeding and you want to share with him or her or, on a therapeutic relationship. So you have to first of all do the, the, the first aid first before you go on with your meeting. Like he said, you don't go to the hospital and start preaching to someone who is naked, someone who is uh, hungry. Mm -hmm. They will not listen to you. So you attend to them, so like in counseling, that is called fasting. You attend to that immediate need before now you proceed with what took you to the, uh, to the hospital or to wherever you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, hospital chaplaincy borrows a lot from uh, that bit of counseling that cancels a lot of loss and grief. Sure. Because you are dealing with people who have some kind of loss. If, for example, you go to the hospital to see the sick, someone who has been told has a terminal illness. Mm -hmm. This is someone who is somehow giving up. The mind is shutting down because they are already seeing that they are dying. There's no way you will approach that person and start talking to them about the word of God. And they have lost hope. Somewhere up in the back of their mind, they're asking themselves, where has God been? Where has God been? And why are you talking to me about God now when all this time I have been suffering, you know? So there's a way in which you need to approach them. But before then, this is someone you're talking to who has lost hope. This is someone who is in denial of the situation in which they are. This is someone who is, has not accepted the reality of what is happening in their life, okay? So there's a way in which you need to approach them. Just like Elder Tom has uh, shared, eh? there's this principle of autonomy. This means uh, allow the patient to be who they are, listen to them and stick to their decision. Whatever decision they have made, whatever it is that they desire, because they are individuals of sound mind, mm -hmm. unless their uh, health has deteriorated that they cannot make sound judgment, or unless they are young children who need to be helped. Otherwise, you leave them to st stick to their decision, go by what they, they, they say. So if you are a caregiver, 
if you are a counselor and you have gone to, to, I mean, to counsel the sick or just to give uh, attention and care to the sick, don't go with your own mind, with your own plans. Listen to them. Give uh, attention to their needs. Allow them to share with you what they have. Allow them to, to speak and share with you in a safe space where they can talk about what is troubling them. So don't go with a plan, and yet that is not their plan. So allow them to be who they are. Another principle that we have is called beneficence. This means going out of your way, doing good to your patient. If you go to the hospital as a caregiver, what is it you can give them? What is it you can do for them? Like Elder Tom is saying, he went to visit a patient, and... Uh, they realized that there was a patient who did not have visitors. Go out of your way. Provide for their needs, all right? Then there's justice. That is also part of the principles. Advocating for the patient. Advocating for the sick. If you're a caregiver, and wherever they are, something is not right. And it is within your means to help and advocate for them. Do it as a caregiver, all right? Then there's another uh, principle called non-malficence, which means do no harm. Me as a caregiver, me as a counselor, the patients, they share a lot with us. There are things they tell us that they don't tell even their loved ones. You as a caregiver, it is upon you to keep that in confidence. Do no harm to that patient. Don't share what they have told you with others. Don't come and share it in your social outfits, like a prayer, you know, a prayer item. You're praying and you're talking about someone else's sickness. In that case, you're already sharing what they are going through. And you're already spreading uh, the, the information that they gave you in confidence. And you're already doing harm to them because they have not shared that with their family members. They are not, they've not shared that with their loved ones. They were not comfortable to share with them and they opened up to you. So please do no harm to them as a caregiver or as a counselor when you're seeing the, the sick. And even when you are with, because this, this ministry uh, ministers to the dying, to the sick, and those who are bereaved, all right? Mm -hmm. And then there's that um, principle of fidelity, being loyal, being loyal. If a patient confides in you and there are things they have told you not to share. If there are things they have told you not to do, if they have told you, I don't want this, be loyal to what they have shared with you so that they have confidence in you. Create that space for them so that they can share with you openly. And in that case, as they share with you openly, you, you realize that you're able to help them beyond what they even anticipated. So as a caregiver, these are principles that we need to have with us. Remember, you're speaking to someone who has given up. You're speaking to someone who feels like the world has uh, left them on their own. The Lord that you have come to preach did not minister to them. That is what they feel, that left them in that dying bed. You're speaking to someone who is not seeing life beyond where they are. So as you speak to them, as you give them that uh, safe space to allow them to confide in you, be confident. Keep the confidentiality that you have assured them so that they can speak to you and your sharing with them can be effective and meaningful. Yeah. Amen. Thank you very much, Sister Caroline. You know, hospital chaplains, it's about you are, you are, you're sacrificing yourself for somebody else, just like Christ did. And you are willing to come and, and support in one way or another. Brother Okal, how can the church participate in this ministry? And it doesn't have to be just visitation, you see. Because I could be having the, 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 the zeal to, to apply the same counseling principle because I have the willingness to go and visit this patient physically. But somebody else would want to know, how else can I actually uh, be supportive to this particular ministry in kind? Thank you very much, yeah. uh, Sister Lily. And I think uh, w what your question basically is, is uh, Chief, give us a practical application of this hospital chaplaincy. 
we are uh, beating about the bush, we are saying so many things. How can I be involved? And, and I think uh, that, that to me is a pertinent question. It's very good. And every church member should be asking this question. How am I going to get involved? Because you see, when we are talking of hospital chaplaincy, let me just speak even from the example of uh, that friend who was being visited and the other one has no fruits. This one has a lot of fruits. Um, you see, do you know if you took fruits to a stranger, they will say God answered their prayer. Do you know that? If you took fruits to a stranger, they will say God answered their prayer. And that is going to be, it is going to be a statement they will make everywhere that you can't believe it. Yesterday, I was feeling hungry. I wanted to eat grapes. And when I prayed, the Lord brought somebody, an angel with grapes. Hospital chaplaincy is our opportunity of being that angel who is working and willing to be used in the hand of God to answer some prayer. When... When somebody has a huge hospital bill, and, and, and I'm just thinking widely, if it's very possible for us here in New Life, when you hear that uh, Elder Chief is unwell, he has a huge hospital bill, the church will form a WhatsApp group. But do you know what will be the impact of us doing a collection today, this afternoon? And then we collect some 5,000 shillings from here. Then we give the hospital chaplaincy leader and she goes with it to KNH, goes to an anonymous bed and says that we have paid 5,000 shillings for your bill. That person will want to know which church is this that is coming to me even without knowing me. Hospital chaplaincy is an entering wedge that the church can use. And all of us need to be friends of this ministry. All of us need to actively participate in this ministry. We have an organized form in which we can do it. We don't want to start opening WhatsApp groups everywhere. But we are saying, members can be able to say, if I don't have the time to come and go with you to the hospital, my contribution to hospital chaplaincy ministry is 5,000 shillings that I am going to give so that some hospital bill can be offset. There's a church member who can just say, uh, I'll be coming with fruits on Sabbath. I can be bringing fruits on Sabbath and whoever is going for hospital chaplaincy, kindly let us pick fruits from the deaconate desk. And the chaplaincy department just comes and picks the fruits and we go. You see, it's, it's not good for us to go by somebody's bed and we are praying to them and we have no fruits. And yet when we are going to visit our siblings, our parents. Let, let me in fact give you a, a practical testimony. At the turn of this year, uh, when we were turning the year, my, my son, my son fell seriously ill. And my son was admitted. And you know, enough, enough church members told me they were praying with me and I believed it. But there is one church member who decided to drive Javieko from her place and came up to Mpisha where, where I was with my kid. And this church member, the son had fried some stew. And they came and they brought for me food to eat. I will not forget that. I, I know others say they prayed for me, and I appreciate. But that one church member who drove and personally came and just said, Chief, you know what? When I heard your son was here, uh, I decided to prepare this because I know you may not have eaten. And it's true, I was a caregiver. I, I, I was with my son. My, my wife was with my daughter, and those of you who know, my daughter is energetic. So my wife didn't even have enough time to fix something for me. But this church member prepared food for the caregiver, not even for the child. And up to right now, I still remember it. What I'm saying is, here we have food remaining in our boots. We can simply pick food here and go with the food for hospital chaplaincy. And we say, caregiver, we have brought this food. You know, at times, the hospital food is also very flat. That thing, after two days, you're just feeling like you're as well sick. But if you can be able to get a way of ministering, and that's why I'm saying, let's not cram hospital chaplaincy. Let's be practical. When we cram, we say that hospital chaplaincy is how many can visit. This thing is more than visitation. We must have the visiting team 
we must have the one that is giving in kind we must have the prayer band for the hospital chaplains inside like that when you go for hospital chaplains you come for us with 15 names of people who are unwell and distribute it for us in church let three church members sister linia can take three people she has never seen and says i am committing to pray to them every saturday every day you give me names of people who are in hospital i will pray for them and each of us can pick only two people to pray for we can say i am in the compassionate side of just giving fruits and we collect all that and th there are so many things we can do you can even send airtime I I'm, I'm saying there is a lot we can do when we go those who go and visit can hear give you feedback you collect and we as church members we participate in the ministry all church members can actively participate let me ask a question which maybe we didn't think mm, sister Carol, how much do you think new life seventh day adventist church allocates to hospital chaplains how, how much do you think is allocated I, I'm, I'm saying this as an elder, so I, I already know. I already know <laughs> elders sit in uh, and, and, and they, they, they know these things. But how much do you think is allocated? Uh, as much as I know, I have an elder who is deeply uh, in the middle of this chaplaincy ministry. I wouldn't quite tell how much, but maybe 100,000. I don't know. Okay, maybe 100,000. Okay, you're very ambitious. You're very ambitious. I, I, allow me to shock you online because the problem with me is when you don't prepare me before I can say so much um, I don't think it's 100,000 I think it's less than 100,000 but you see this is a compassionate ministry let me tell you we cannot be a church that is having a carpeted platform when people in the hospital do not have food I, I, I don't know what you're going to talk about I am not against development, but we cannot be a church that is building up a 15-story building when we have people in hospital who have hospital bills and they can't pay for it. Listen, these things are earthly things. We are going to leave them here. We must get to a level where we are shifting our mindset, being compassionate and thinking of people. Do you know one reason why some of these other ministries, like the Catholic Church, when they go to an area, they start a dispensary that is giving people f free treatment. We don't need to start a dispensary. We have hospitals. We can say that let us even increase the amount of money. You can give money anonymously. 100,000, my sister, you can give 100,000 anonymously to chaplaincy uh, hospital. What I'm saying is as church members, uh, our mindset should... Uh, realign and when we realign our mindset we must think that God wants us to reach people out there by each of us participating in fact the question should be as church members do you think you've contributed to hospital chaplaincy directly or indirectly that's what I could say Amen. Oh, thank you so much that is quite elaborate do you have anything yeah, to yeah, add before I, just, I give you I just this? want to <laughs> add of that and, and thank you and the chief um, you know, this, this ministry is... Uh, people may think that this ministry is about going to the hospital and preaching. No. Actually, Christ's method is not that way. There is nowhere that Christ started preaching to the sick. This ministry is not... We are using the hospital just for reference, but it's not about hospitals. It's about the sick the caregivers and the healthcare people. So uh, it's about meeting these people where they are. So you don't have to think of, can I go to KNH? Then I can have done the ministry. No, there's someone who is not even able to get himself to the hospital, either logistically or financially. That person needs support. So it's not that you sit and say, I'm not a good preacher, I don't understand the Bible. Actually, Christ is giving us the best method that the best way to reach to these people is through love. And when we share love with them, 
That is the biggest, the greatest sermon we can ever do. Uh, some of these people are even resistant. They don't believe in God. Do you want to say that when you go to the hospital, you want to ask who is a Christian, then you only visit the Christian? No. You are attending to them at their points of need. So you'll meet people who are not Christians. You'll meet, meet those who are Christians. They don't believe. They are not Adventists. And this ministry is for all. So there are those who do not even want to hear about, even see you with the Bible. So if you meet me going for the ministry and I don't have the Bible, it's okay. So if you are thinking of being part of this, if you can provide care, if you can be patient, actually. You know some of these people just need someone to sit with them. You're just seated there with them at their hospital bed and uh, just listening. You're just patient with them. And, and that means a lot to them because they, they have no one to talk to. It's, it's, um, it's, it's, it's about bridging that gap because it reaches a point that the doctor realizes that this case is now beyond the treatment. And you see the doctor after the round picking the call and calling the chaplain that I have a patient who needs to be attended by a chaplain and I'm requesting you to take that patient over. Because some of these people, they have known that uh, maybe the doctor has even prescribed that this one has only three weeks to live. And, and you see, uh, with that, they start going through that agonizing and, and, and side challenges and, and uh, they lose their dignity in life. They start giving up in life. They refuse to eat. So their state becomes horrible. Now we are supposed to bring dignity to these people, whether they are Christians or not. Uh, some people think that you are going there to do deathbed conversion. Far from it. You go give your support. If the person feels they need God, they need salvation, they'll talk to you. They'll tell you that, can you call for me a pastor? Then it's you to ask them, do you want a particular pastor? Your pastor? Or I can bring any pastor? Because you find that at the point of death, people want to do certain final rites. And depending on their backgrounds, they, they believe that there are some things that they just want pastor to, to do for them. So if they tell you I'm a Catholic, call for me my, my priest. Please, please, don't come and uh, call Pastor Kali that I've met some sick person who needs a pastor and he, he's a Catholic, so I want us to take advantage. No, it's not about that. Go and bring that priest to talk to that patient. Th this is a, a ministry not like any other. So it's through our love that they get to discover us and they get to relate with us and they get to find out who is this God we believe in? And they'll start. Let them be the one to ask you, I need a Bible to read. Or let the patient be the one to tell you, can you pray for me? Don't go there and start praying. Some patients will just shout aloud and say, I don't want to see this person. Yeah. So it's a ministry that works with the institutions. It works with the families affected to make sure that there is... A, compassionate care of these patients, that they have dignity in life, even if their situation is that bad, they are still valuable. Their life is still valuable. So, there are many things we can do, as has been said, and I'm sure that each one of us can do something about this ministry. Thank Amen. You. Thank you very much. Just to Elder. say something. Okay, you have Carol. Just, say something. Uh, just to add on what my elders have said, mm. Uh, uh, I had the uh, elder chief urging us as members of church to participate in the hospital ministry. But what kind of a person are you? You need to assess and speak to yourself. Are you in the right position to be able to minister to the sick, to the dying, 
are you empathizing enough or are you going there to start sympathizing with their situation mm. that they start feeling so bad about <laughs> what is going on in their in their life or in the status in which they are these are skills that we also need to acquire there's a difference between being sympathetic and empathetic when you sympathize it means you fall so deeply into the issues of of your patient or of your client you know that if they are sick you are not able to even hold their hands and raise them from the the mud in which they have fallen into but when you are empathetic yes you feel for them but you don't get so lost into their issues so these are skills that we need to acquire be empathetic are you genuine with yourself or you are pretending because some of us sometimes we are able to see if you're pretending i will know and it will hurt me as a patient that you are pretend be genuine with yourself be genuine with the situation that is before you and how are you looking at the patient are you judgmental there's something called unconditional positive regard take them as they are in, in the story that we were taught this morning in our in the sermon that bit of the story that uh, our preacher was saying that wasn't mentioned in the bible that maybe some people were saying i spoke to him i warned him you know so maybe this is a patient that you you worked with you warned them now instead of being compassionate and very kind to them you're speaking so badly about them even in in their hearing that i warned them i told them so you go there and start judging the patient so speak to yourself ask yourself are you in the right position to be able to be a caregiver to be able to counsel someone who is sick all right these are some of the things that we need to assess in our lives before we become part of hospital ministry are you able to listen with respect are we able to listen with respect this is what we are called for are you able to offer comfort in terms of distress to the patient to the bereaved to the dying you know are you able to offer and provide partnership in terms of praying and even spiritual counseling? Once you have met their physical needs, then they will be able to call you for prayer, like Elder said. But if you go there, he's dying, and you want to pray. You've carried your big Bible, like the Elder's Bibles, <laughs> and you want to read a Bible verse. You want to talk about God. And he's been wondering all this time, no one has visited them. The people in prisons, when you go there, you're part of their family. Some of them are abandoned there. And you want to go there and talk about God. They're asking themselves, where has God been? Why can't he talk to my family members to come and, and see me? So meet their physical needs before you get to reach to them. Thank Amen. you. Thank you so much, Carol. The aspect of preparedness. You have to be prepared. And she has talked about the skills and how you need to go there. Even... Just pray. Before you go, you pray. And that's why I was saying, when you're going for a mission, you are going for a particular mission. How is your heart? How are you? Eh? How are you presenting yourself to this person? You know, even as you pray to them, I, have you made yourself, have you have had a meeting with yourself and God? Because this is a ministry which is spiritual, which is, which is attached to, to heaven. Uh, in, in, in terms of with what we are doing, my, my elder here has also talked about uh, uh, so much, but because time is mo moving and I also want to look at the online viewers chat, kindly tell us how we can synergize in this church with other departments. We, we have so many departments in the church with different roles, some, some of the roles look similar to us. We want to see the scope of hospital chaplaincy and how do we synergize, work collaboratively so that we can have the effective role of evangelism as the final goal, applying the method of Christ as we do our hospital chaplaincy. Karibu. Yeah, th thank you for that question. I think that is a very important question, especially in our setup as a church. This is a church where we have the elders council. And in the Elders' Council, one of our key responsibility is visitation. Yeah? Uh, this is a church where we have the deaconate, which also handles visitation. I I'm not getting into the details of visiting who, because I know the first thing we will think of is, you start with where? 
Jerusalem as you go. This is the church where we have the welfare ministry. So someone uh, may think that if it is a matter of death or sickness, why don't we let the welfare handle that? This is a, a, a church where we have the pastorate also in here. So you, you may tend to wonder that then, how does this work? But I want to tell you that uh, all these other ministries, their work is cut out for them. It is, it is visitation to the, to the members. And in, in any case, if you ask them that you have a neighbor who needs to be visited and prayed for. That's very clear. But when you come to talk about hostel ministry, we've already seen that this is a ministry that has a different kind of approach. You have to be very sensitive and you have to be very careful in how you handle every situation that you are dealing with. So you'll find that this ministry is able to rope in welfare because welfare is capable of providing maybe uh, bedding, is able to provide maybe be food. Maybe welfare would provide hostel bill, you know. So they come in in that aspect. Deaconet also is able to mobilize for resources that can support these people. But, but you know there is another aspect that we've not talked about because of time. This is a ministry that we also even go for celebrations. A patient has been in hospital for a long time, maybe one year or maybe six months. And they've gone through surgery and all this. And finally they, have, they are healed. They, are, uh, they have been discharged. You know, the first person they want to call is uh, that chaplain who was working with me at the ward. They want to celebrate with you. So it's not just about the sad part of it as we've talked about. There's also that beautiful part of it. And that is where the ministry comes in. That's where I can rope in pastor, my pastor. That pastor, we are going for this function, this event. Let's go together. Can you give a sermon it? No, that, that is now the environment that pastor can now give a sermon it. Or elder chief can now give a sermon it and we can pray. Because that trust has been built. We've walked the journey. And they feel that surely someone powerful has done this for me. Even if they didn't believe in God. And that time they'll give you a listening ear. That is where now the evangelistic aspect now comes in. Now the, the relatives start asking, and who is this guy who has come to this event and is being given a lot of prominence? That is when they'll start talking of you that how you used to visit them at the ward, how you used to support them, and how you are patient with them. You know, we, we find cases where someone knows they are going to die. It's very clear. And, and they need to be prepared for death. And the doctor is not... The doctors are not trained to prepare them for death. They are only trained to tell you that, uh, or to tell your relatives that things are really bad. Eh? But who then comes in to prepare this person for death? It is you, the chaplain. You have to make sure you move them from that stage of denial to the stage that they will finally accept that this is the reality. Then once they accept, they start asking themselves questions. That money which I have in the bank, that investment which I made, which I didn't tell anyone, you know, you'll find that you are now the bridge through which you will bring in a lawyer, he can do the will. So you help this person to die peacefully, to die with dignity, without a lot of pain and without a lot of worries. So. Every department, we have religious liberty where we have lawyers. So every department can be roped in into this and to support in this ministry. So I would just urge that uh, uh, we need to be ready and find our space within this ministry scope and see how we can be part of it. By the way, let me say that myself, I'm not a qualified chaplain. I, I look forward to that. 
but I'm still far from being a qualified chaplain. This is a very highly professional work, but we thank God that he has given us the grace and the ability to do it. And I'm sure he can give it to anyone else. Yes. If I knew that I, I could only do well at the children's ministry, then God has revealed something to me that I can as well do to serve. So I, I would urge any, everyone that the scope is quite large and uh, we just need to have this conversation going so that we find how each one of us can fit in. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. We are almost uh, closing the program. Uh, let me go to my online viewers. Um, uh, some of them are following and appreciating the program, like Samuel Akiri, uh, Group Youth, Youth. Uh, there is a Powell who is saying Happy Sabbath. And then there is a comment from one of them. But the money can be paid for someone who does not need it. Elder Okal, be ready to answer the viewer here is concerned. <laughs> While the person who needs assistance most is not reached, we have to, to ask God for the spirit of discernment. This, the same person has also gone ahead to say, we have to be careful of the food we give to hospital patients. We may, may be wanting to do good, but we find ourselves doing more harm. Sister Caro. <laughs> So, Brother uh, uh, Elder Okal, you can respond to that as we do our parting shots okay. as we close the Thank program. you very much. <laughs> yeah, I, I think our time is far spent and we yeah. should be finalizing. Um, b before I respond to that, I just want to remind us that this was Jesus' way. Jesus ministered to them and then after he had ministered to them, we end up now finding again... Mm -hmm. Jesus getting to the point of these are the poor asking about Jesus. If you go to John chapter 9, there's a man who was born blind. This man, Jesus heals him, a controversy arises, and they're saying, Hey, who has made you blind? The man was testifying about Jesus without knowing Jesus until he gets to a point where Jesus, in verses uh, 35, Jesus asks the man, do you believe in the Son of God? The man tells Jesus, who is the Son of God so that I may believe on him? Now, do, do you see where that comes in? The man was born blind, he's been having problems. Jesus deals with him and clears everything until because of what Jesus has done for him, he went on constantly talking about Jesus. And that is, that is the direction hospital chaplaincy is supposed to be. That we can minister to people not with the mindset of going to convert them. Minister to them. Then one day they will be able to reflect and say there is a group that came and ministered to me. I want to, I want to go back and find where is that group. And so these people go back to the hospital. They ask the hospital, do you know the person who came to the hospital on 15th of June? Then the hospital checks and says, no, it was Elder Tom. And then they go check, where is Elder Tom? And these people may come to want to know who is the God of Elder Tom, who can make these things be done. Uh, the, the, the point that was being said about um, giving the money, that is why I am saying we, we need to really accept as a church the benefit of systematic benevolence. Mm. Systematic benevolence says that bring all the money into the storehouse. So you as a church member, don't worry about who is going to be given the money. Bring the money to the storehouse. Then the money is allocated to the hospital chaplaincy department. Mm -hmm. Hospital chaplaincy department, as they go about meeting people in hospital, they don't go meeting people asking them, do you want your bill to be paid? No. The Holy Spirit will guide you as a chaplain and you will see that this is a need and this is not a need. And this is not a need. So, don't worry about, about that one per se. The Lord will guide us because we are a prayerful ministry. In fact, one of the departments that we are strongly aligned to is the prayer ministry. And by the time we are identifying that this person... And, and let me tell you, we can't be too keen about clearing a hospital bill 
when we are clearing school fees without so much how do we determine those so what i'm basically saying is yes that is a concern but it can be addressed you see even the issue of the food yes it is very clear there are people who are under instruction in the hospital by the medics on what they should take and that is why as hospital chaplaincy department we are in line and we are coordinating with the hospital itself before you administer any food stuff or even the fruits you are in line with the hospital are we allowed to provide this if the hospital tells us we cannot give food to the patients but there's a caregiver as we said this caregiver is is healthy he can be able to eat the avocados it doesn't mean that every fruit we take to the hospital is for the patient it may be that there is a caregiver who has not eaten the whole day taking care of the patient we can be able to minister to them and that's why i think elder tom clarified that this ministry is not for the dying only it is not for the sick only it's also for the caregivers it is even for the healthcare workers do you know how many doctors are stressed we can just go to the hospital to pray with the doctors and encourage doctors i have doctor friends who are stressed because they lost a patient if you lose a patient which ministry is better than hospital chaplaincy to come and comfort you there is a doctor who has done everything and nothing seems to be working and this is a young doctor who just graduated from campus the other day who can talk to them if not hospital chaplains and and some of these doctors you find he has been on call for 36 hours what is wrong if as a as a team we went and bought for this doctor mango juice and this doctor drinks mango juice having been on call for 36 hours no sleep we can be able to minister it's a ministry to everyone in that setup remember a well taken care of doctor will take care of patients a well taken care of caregiver will take care of the patients and this ministry prays not only for the patient we also pray for the caregiver that the lord may give that caregiver a heart we also pray for the doctor that the lord may help the doctor to administer the right medicine for the doctor also to have a heart you know at times it's difficult even to explain to some families what is happening to their patient that doctor needs a heart so what we are saying is we are a ministry that is seeking to reach out and so we want all church members to join hands with this ministry allow me to say this as my parting shot new life <laughs> church and seventh day adventist members mm. and the world at large christians i think if there's a neglected ministry it is this one we have neglected hospital chaplaincy we have not done well in this one and that is why the bible says if you do good to those who do good unto you what gift have you None. if you visit those who are your friends what gift have you None. if you only feed those who are your neighbors what gift have you mm. if you are only going to pray for those who are your friends you know when i am sick elder tom must pray for me not <laughs> that he will he must he is my friend but it takes a different spirit it takes a compassionate spirit it takes an evangelistic spirit for me to go and pray for a total stranger and that is what god is calling us to in these last days god is calling us to hospital chaplaincy ministry mm. while we are thinking of all the other big plans we have hospital chaplaincy ministry is us reaching to the unreached in their suffering mm. and that one god has promised us in matthew 25 mm. that one the lord is going to bless mm. and he will say come ye blessed of my father to the kingdom prepared to you before the foundation of the world Amen. may god bless you all Amen. and may god help us that we may accept to be part of this hospital chaplaincy work please tell even your neighbors tell your friends let them go through this presentation that we've shared and let them join hands with this ministry it's a blessed ministry Amen. thank you thank you elder okal sister karo parting shot uh, thank you very much uh, elder okal um a well informed caregiver is an effective caregiver so i urge all of us get to know what is uh, what are the details and what it takes to be an effective caregiver read if you can share with the chaplaincy team 
let them share with you their experiences, what they have gone through, so that you can be effective when you're caregiving. When you have information and you've gone to caregive, then even the patient will feel like they have been ministered to. When you know that there are sub, uh, social groups, like for example, those who have terminal illnesses, there are social groups of people living with a kind of illness, and they share their experiences and all that. If you are informed, you'll be able to hold their hands to join them in such support groups. I heard of a group called Waiting Rooms. If you know of a lady or a mother who hasn't been blessed, you join them with such groups. They share their experiences so that they don't feel like they're so lonely. So I urge each one of us, let us go out of our way. Let us learn and learn all that there is for us to be able to be effective. And remember to respect the autonomy of the patient. Let's not insist on what we want to do. Let's listen to the desires of our patients. I said that this also goes along with those who are bereaved. So my last bit is this. Don't grieve alone. Share. Share with others and take good care of yourself. May the Lord bless each one of us. Amen. Sante. Brother Uma, we yes. are finishing. Okay. Thank you. My, my parting shot. I want to talk about three things. One is that uh, if I had a chance to talk to the GC or our church, one thing that I would have wanted to be changed is the name from hospital ministry to healthcare ministry, healthcare chaplaincy, so that we remove this thinking that we can only do this ministry in hospitals. The, the second thing I want to say is that um, uh, we, we could be here, we are talking about us going out. But there could be someone seated here who is struggling with sickness, who is devastated, they don't know whom to talk to, who was a patient for many years, they have been struggling, they need that support. I, I would argue that feel free. Feel free to seek help. Feel free to seek help. You can either get help from the counseling but, or you can come to the hospital ministry leadership and uh, we will see how to support you. Uh, finally, I want to say that we are being called into this ministry. And, uh, and this just brings to my thinking of when Isaiah was being called, when he was touched by that fire on, on his lips. You know, I, I want to read Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 as I close. It, it tells us that um, after the touch, yeah, then it says, Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me, Lord. I, I want to pray that you meditate over this and if you've gotten the message we've shared this day, since morning up to this moment and you feel convicted that there's something you can do to progress this ministry which Christ himself initiated please offer yourself that you may be able to go and serve may God bless you may God guide us even as we prepare for his second coming Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. We've come to the end of our program. Thank you very much, our physical audience, our online viewers, for giving us your a, a small attention to listen to how we operate in this department. We want to finish up with the song service. Choristers, kindly come. As, yeah. So we please... Uh, uh, open the song, song 537, as Elder Okal calls an oracle, just to pray for those who are willing to support the department and uh, just work together towards reaching those who need our, our help. Thank you. Let's all rise up as we do the finishing song. Yes.
This is a unique one. Allow me to request. How many would want to join the hospital ministries department in any facet of supporting the ministry? Any person you just want to support the ministry, either through prayer, in kind, being part of the team that will be doing visitation, wherever, what the Lord can allow you to support the hospital chaplaincy ministry. Let's pray for those who have responded. Heavenly Father, these uplifted hands are hands of people saying that, Lord, I am desirous to support hospital chaplaincy. God revealed to me the line of support you want me to give to the ministry, and I will give it. Dear Lord, we are not calling everyone to be foot soldiers. We are not calling everyone to be in the prayer band. We are not calling everyone to give in kind. But we are saying everyone according to their several abilities, allow them to support this ministry. And that's why your children have raised their hands. Now God, I am praying, it's a hand of faith that has been raised by somebody. Now God, please strengthen that faith, strengthen that resolve, strengthen that commitment. And God, please help us that through the hospital ministry department, we may be able to go on this chaplaincy work to reach out to people that they may see you and not us. 
God, this is not a ministry for us to uplift ourselves. It's a ministry for us to bring you closer to those who are going through challenges that this world has brought before them. And so, God, please, we are lifting our hands. We want to be co-workers with you. Strengthen us. Use us. And now to each and every one of us in this place, thank you for giving us an opportunity to sit here and listen to you. Thank you for the team that has been online following on this message. I pray that you may bless all of us. And God, you may draw us closer to you to do your will at all times is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The Lord bless you all and the Lord keep you all safe.